A Drink to Health, Herbal Wine in Ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks drank wine for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Although diluted, wine was not only a satisfying beverage, but also a nourishing and healing tonic. In the medical context, ancient Greek physicians incorporated wine in their medicinal offerings for its therapeutic benefits to both the body and the mind. In this presentation, we will explore the art of herbal wine, which surprisingly goes beyond just the drinking cup. We will also learn about the herbs that were commonly infused in wine, and our curiosity will bring us closer to understanding the ancient Greek culture, particularly through the well-known physicians who wrote about ancient medicine. Finally, we will give thanks to Dionysus, the Greek god of wine himself, who was celebrated throughout the ancient Greek world for his gift to humankind. As one ancient physician said, there is no topic more difficult to handle or more full of detail, seeing that it is hard to say whether wine does good to people rather than harming them. Because the ancient Greek civilization spans thousands of years, beginning with the Minoan civilization on Crete around 3000 BCE and the Mycenaean civilization on the mainland around 1600 BCE, there are distinct characteristics among the many people who lived on this ancient Mediterranean land. The archaeological and historical evidence of medicinal applications of herbs varies from place to place and will only ever provide a glimpse into a fascinating culture of mythological gods, famous philosophers, and grand temples with ancient rituals that remain forever mysterious. Understanding herbal medicine in antiquity requires a thorough examination of surviving ancient texts and archeological evidence, usually found in shipwrecks or in places like Pompeii. Wine was a part of daily life and was written about by various ancient authors, both as a healing medicine and as a sinful act, depending on the intention and the amount consumed. Some of the earliest written evidence of herbal use in Greece was found on tablets dating from the 14th and 13th centuries BCE, which lists the use of coriander, safflower, and saffron. Texts by numerous ancient physicians have provided the most evidence of herbal medicine, including by Hippocrates, Dioscorides, and Galen, as we will learn about shortly. Archaeological remains of shipwrecks with intact amphora, large jugs used for storage and transport, have been found to have remnants of ginger, mint, rosemary, thyme, oregano, and sage. Fortunately for us, not so much for those who were on the ships, these shipwrecks give us a glimpse of how and where goods were traded. Amphora were essential in the trade of wine and oil across the seas to cities on the Italian peninsula to the region of the Black Sea, or to people living on the northern rim of Africa. A 4th century written source recorded 3,000 jars of Mendian wine the most well-known and highly regarded wine of classical antiquity, which were being shipped to the Black Sea region, a heavy importer of Greek wine. Piecing together historical and archeological evidence can help us understand the value of these natural products among the many peoples who lived in this region. To begin our journey in ancient Greece, we start at the table. Across the land, Wine was a common household and community beverage made from the grapevine, Vitus vinifera, which was called ampelos in ancient Greek. Wine was enjoyed with meals, diluted usually at one part wine and two to three parts water. For breakfast, it was often paired with hard barley bread for dipping and fresh figs or olives. It was a common beverage with lunch and dinner as well, and always diluted as the Greeks felt that drinking undiluted wine, or akraton, was uncivilized or vulgar. Undiluted wine was also considered to make the spirits weak, leading to drunkenness or madness. 
At community gatherings, such as the symposium, wine was enjoyed by male citizens who gathered for nighttime revelry with music and games. Women were excluded from these gatherings unless they were part of the entertainment. I like to think they were having their own party behind the scenes. The host of the symposium, called the Symposiarch, was in charge of determining how strong the wine would be for the evening, how much water to add for its dilution based on their preference for how festive they wanted the evening to be. There were also special cups made for drinking wine. These were called kylix. On them were painted with scenes of merriment, drinking, or nudity, often painted on the bottom of the cup to be revealed after the cup was emptied. These cups were shaped more like a bowl with a broad and shallow body and with two handles on the sides to hold the contents steady. Another kind of cup was called the cantaros, and this was a tall and narrow vessel with handles supposedly used only for rituals and ceremonies to honor Dionysus, the god of wine. Because wine was such an integral part to daily life and customs, it is perhaps not surprising how prevalent it was in the medicinal context. There were countless variations on herbal wines made in ancient Greece, depending on the location, the season, and the availability of ingredients. Wines for local use were stored in wine skins, while those for trade were shipped in amphoras sealed with pitch, the crystallized sap of the pine tree. In these wines, you could detect the taste of pine, and even today, there is a white wine in Greece called retsina, which is made by fermenting the wine in casks lined with pitch. As a preservative, Honey was sometimes added to wine, which of course also sweetened it. As we know today, there are many studies demonstrating the efficacy of wine on health when enjoyed in moderation. Wine is rich in antioxidants and polyphenols that benefit the cardiovascular system and protect brain and nerve cells. Red wine in particular may also help prevent blood clots and chronic diseases associated with inflammation. Three bowls do I mix for the temperate, one to health, which they empty first, the second to love and pleasure, the third to sleep. When this bowl is drunk up, wise guests go home. The fourth bowl is ours no longer, but belongs to violence, the fifth to uproar, the sixth to drunken revel, the seventh to black eyes, the eighth is the policeman's, the ninth belongs to billousness, and the tenth to madness and hurling the furniture. While the ancient Greeks were unaware of our modern scientific evidence, they were aware of its many health benefits for ailments ranging from intestinal worms to infected wounds. All doctors in ancient Greece considered wine as a remedy, or pharmakon, to be administered accordingly and with the addition of infused herbs, wine's medicinal benefit increased considerably. In order to learn about herbal wines in ancient Greece, we, we must first meet the physicians who wrote about them. First and foremost, there was Hippocrates, considered the father of medicine, who lived during Greece's classical period in the 5th century BCE. During this time, the theories of disease were slowly shifting away from divine and supernatural causes and towards environmental and natural factors, a theory that Hippocrates and his followers propelled, and which included the theory of the four humors. Hippocrates taught at a medical school and reportedly wrote countless texts about health, sickness, and diagnosis. Most well-known is the Hippocratic Corpus, a collection of texts associated with Hippocrates and his teachings, although probably not all written by him. Scholars still don't know who the author or authors were. In this collection, the ancient Greek word for wine, enos, is mentioned 867 times, an impressive number 
indicating wine's prominent role in healing uses. After Hippocrates, a teacher and botanist named Theophrastus wrote the nine-volume text Angry into Plants, which earned him the name Father of Botany by Carl Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist in the 1700s. His text mentions numerous applications of wine. One example is of mountain celery or parsley administered in sweet white wine in cases of strangury, which is painful frequent urination, and for those suffering from stone. He describes parsley as having leaves like that of hemlock, the root is slender, and fruit like that of dill, but smaller. It is given in dry wine for diseases of women. Whatever these diseases of women might have been, he does not specify, but we will explore wine and women shortly. Of all the ancient physicians, I am particularly fond of Theophrastus because he was born on the island of Lesvos in Greece, where my family is from. The physician Pliny the Elder wrote countless books, but only his 37 volume textbook, Naturalis Historia, or natural history has survived. Centuries later, many of the plants he wrote about would be adopted by Carl Linnaeus in his systemization of plants. Pliny's book includes chapters such as remedies derived from the garden plants or remedies derived from the forest trees. In his chapter entitled, The Properties of Plants and Fruits, Pliny also mentions a bladder remedy Calithrix, beaten up with cumin seed and administered in white wine, is useful also for diseases of the bladder. Leaves of vervain boil down to one-third, or root of vervain, in warm honeyed wine, expel caculi of the bladder. Calithrix was identified as Asplenium trichomanes, which today is called maidenhair spleenwort. Around the same time as Pliny, Dioscorides wrote De Materia Medica, a five-volume manuscript describing approximately 600 plants for more than a thousand remedies. This textbook was hand-copied and referenced countless times over the following 1,500 years. As a result, he would be considered the basis of European and Western pharmacopoeia by later scholars. Dioscorides dedicated an entire book to vines and wines, providing fascinating details on the differences between colors, flavors, and wines from different areas, and how each factor affected the body. For example, the wine from Lesbos is easily digested, lighter than the Chian wine from Skios in the Aegean Sea, and good for the intestines. He also noted that generally all unmixed and simple wine, hard by nature, is warming, easily digested, and good for the stomach. It also encouraged the appetite, is nourishing, induces sleep, and causes a good color. The last ancient physician I will mention who also extolled the virtues of medicinal wine was Galen. He wrote extensively about herbal wine including the varieties made across the Mediterranean region. Galen practiced medicine in Rome for many years, where he was the physician to numerous emperors. He wrote 300 texts, including De Simplicibus Medicaminibus, on simple medicines, about the uses and locality of plants. He also revived the centuries-old theory of the four humors written about by Hippocrates, which would be practiced for a millennium after his death. In his opinion, of all the varieties of wine, the best is watery wine, or wine that has the same appearance as water. This wine, he said, helped expel phlegm from the lung, since it strengthens and exercises a moderately dampening and incisive action on the humors. Given the many centuries between each of these physicians, it is impressive that wine continued to be applied in medicine. Why this is no longer the case, especially in our work as herbalists, is a curious phenomenon. 
and perhaps likely due to the cultural, religious, or political movements forbidding alcohol at different points in time during the past centuries. As ancient medicine, wine was categorized by its effect on the body. It was considered hot and dry in contrast to water, which was cold and wet. The dosage of wine depended on the condition of the patient, their age, temperament, and the season. There were also differences in wine to consider when prescribing. Was it a heavy or soft wine? And how and where was it made? According to Hippocrates, heavy or concentrated wine leads to a heavier head and difficulty thinking. Soft wine, on the other hand, could cause inflammation in the spleen and liver and produce wind in the intestine. Physicians in later centuries agreed. Dioscorides wrote that hard wine causes headaches and soft wine affected the digestive system. Galen, even later, wrote that soft and full wines travel through the body slowly and aggravate rather than diminish the obstruction of swollen organs. He also made comparison between wine that warmed or cooled the body. Straw wine, which is the warmest wine after yellow wine, affects the head and thinking more so than dark wine, precisely because it is hotter. The detrimental effects of wine were well known, and in cases of underlying conditions, wine was prohibited for people who suffered from diseases of the head, pleurisy, lethargy, and other similar acute diseases. Galen specifically advises against wine in people with a very hot nature, since it produces heat and dryness. Rather, it is better for them to drink water than wine, or a light and moderately hard wine. As mentioned earlier, undiluted wine was greatly frowned upon, but there were instances when undiluted wine was recommended, as in the case after a bad hangover, or as an antidote against poison hemlock, wolfsbane, mushrooms, and even for stings and bites that kill through sudden cooling. When used soundly, it was agreed, wine can contribute to the reestablishment of good health. The Greek philosopher Plutarch who also served as a priest at the sacred temple of Apollo at Delphi, considered wine the most pleasant of remedies. This is the entry on wine from Lesbos in Dioscorides' book De Materia Medica. Omphakitis Enos, lesbian wine from Lesbos. The wine called Amphocytes is made properly in Lesbos the grapes, not yet ripe in every part but tasting sour, are dried in the sun for three or four days until the clusters are wrinkled, and after pressing out the wine is placed in the sun in ceramic jars. It is astringent, good for the stomach, for lustful women, and aphrodisiac, those with pains in the small intestine, those with difficult digestion and a squeamish stomach. It is sipped up to help plague symptoms. Such wines as these are used after many years, for otherwise they are not drinkable. Because the ancient physicians were all men, there is little understanding of how women fared when needing medical care. These texts sometimes are blatant in their ignorance of the female body. But as many things about the human body were yet unknown, it is impressive nonetheless that some of these remedies may have been successful. In books in the Hippocratic Corpus relating to women, there were a variety of strange but perhaps effective remedies for general infections or complications with pregnancies. For postpartum diarrhea, for example, there was the recommendation to take a black grape, the inside of a sweet pomegranate, crush and mix in dark wine, scrape in some goat's cheese, sprinkle with some flour from roasted wheat, and well mixed, give it to drink. To help the opposite problem, Dioscorides recommended dwarf olive wine for postpartum constipation. Another recommendation, although vague, was rue in some dark wine, which helped remove the afterbirth of a delivery. A recipe with adiantum, or maidenhair fern, crushed into dark wine following a course of treatment with milk helped with vaginal infections. In Dioscorides' book, Hellebore wine purges women after childbirth and abortions, 
is an abortive fashion and is available for womb strangulation. There were also wine-based fumigations, which today we call yoni steams. These helped put back into place a lifted womb, and if the uterus was deviated, some wild figs were placed in the wine. Presumably, the woman sat over a heated vessel so that the odor passing through the narrow gap will arrive at the womb. There was also a recipe for a prolapsed womb. It should be cleaned with dark wine in which a pomegranate has been boiled before being put back in place. A method for healing vaginal infections I would not recommend at all today was injections into the uterus. In one of Hippocrates' books, in a list of 35 recipes for injections, 13 included wine. It is clearly evident the influence wine had as a healing medium. Lastly, a wine for abortion was thought to be effective because it grew near Scamoni, Convolvus scamonia, a plant of the morning glory family. Today it is recognized that the dried roots of yield a strong purgative. It reads, Enos Ptorios Enibruon, abortion wine, poisonous. A wine is made that destroys embryos, for among the vines planted there is planted veratrum, wild cucumber or scamoni, from which the grapes take the strength, and the wine made from the grapes growing near them becomes destructive. Eight cups mixed with water is given to women fasting, having first vomited. Pliny the Elder recommended a blend of anise seeds chewed with honey and rinsed with wine for irresistibly sweet-smelling breath. Dioscorides recommended sage wine for disorders of the kidneys and bladder and for coughs, bruises, and impeded menstrual flow. A well-loved herb-infused wine included the herb wormwood, or Amesia absinthum. This herbal wine, also called vermouth, was made by soaking a handful of wormwood in a gallon of red wine for at least a month. Wormwood helped expel intestinal worms and parasites and calmed irritated and inflamed stomachs. It is considered a cholagogue, meaning it stimulates production and flow of bile helps with fevers as a febrifuge and with, with menstrual flow as an amenagogue. Hippocrates prescribed vermouth for jaundice, rheumatism, anemia, and menstrual pains. Bitter herbs such as gentian, chicory, dandelion root, and calamus root were often blended with sweet herbs for a more pleasant taste including fennel, licorice, cinnamon, ginger, or cardamom. Other common herbs infused in ancient Greek wine included rue, violet, rose, and coriander. In his chapter on wines, Dioscorides includes recipes with quince, pear, pomegranate, rose, myrtle, fig, elecampane, and juniper berries, just to name a few. Because there were so many varieties of herbal wines, there were also countless ways to make them. Generally, it involved harvesting the plant part and letting it sit in jugs with other ingredients between 10 and 40 days, or up to three months, as is the case with thyme. This is the entry on hyssop wine in De Materia Medica, Enos Isopites. The best hyssop wine is that which is made from Cilician hyssop. It is made with absinthitis. Put one pound of bruised hyssop leaves wrapped in a thin linen cloth into nine gallons of must and also put in small stones so that the bundle subsides to the bottom. After 40 days, strain it and put it in another jar. It is good for disorders in the chest, side, and lungs and for old coughs and asthma. It is diuretic, good for griping, and the periodical chills of fevers, and it induces the menstrual flow. Enos nectarites, 
Ella Campaign wine. Nectaritas is made from Ella Campaign. Tie five ounces of dried Ella Campaign root in a linen cloth. Put it into six gallons of must, and after three months, take it out. It is good for the stomach and the chest and expels urine. It is also called Medica, Symphytum, Idaeum verbascum, Orestion, or Nectarion. Enos Thumides, Thyme Wine. Bind 100 ounces of pounded sifted thyme in a linen cloth. Put it into 9 gallons of must for 3 months and then jar it. It is good for digestive difficulties, lack of appetite, dysentery, disorders of the nerves, and hypochondria, nervous gastric disorder, for winter shiverings, and for poison from venomous creatures that chill and putrefy. Wine has the property of heating the parts of the body inside when it is drunk and of cooling them when poured on the outside. The ingenuity of herbal wines did not just apply to drinking it for health. There were other applications that were also effective, as we learned with remedies for women's bodies. A common recommendation by Hippocratic doctors was washing wounds with wine, which acted as a disinfectant. For open fractures, bandages were soaked in hard dar dark wine and wrapped around the wound. Old and soft wines are good for wounds and inflammations applied with greasy wool, says Dioscorides. The efficacy of wine in wounds was due to its antiseptic properties, which have also been confirmed by modern science. As we learned about maidenhair spleenwort from Pliny, the plant was also useful in coloring hair. He writes, For this purpose, a decoction of it is made in wine with parsley seed, large quantities of oil being added, if it is desired to make the hair thick and curly as well. It also has the property of preventing the hair from coming off. Wine was also mentioned in fantastical myths with perhaps a touch of sorcery. Wine infused with a special drug was taken after battle in Homer to bring about complete forgetfulness. Dioscorides identifies this special herb as borage, Virago officinalis. In a myth of jealousy, Medea tries poisoning her son-in-law Theseus with a cup of wine laced with aconite. He was saved when his father dashed the cup from his hands. Nesithius said that the gods revealed wine to mortals to be the greatest blessing for those who use it correctly, and for those who use it unregulated, the opposite. For it gives nourishment to those who use it well, and strengthens the soul and the body. In medicine, it is a very useful thing. Indeed, it can be mixed with medicines in a potion, and it is beneficial for those who have wounds. In daily gatherings, for those who drink a moderated and mixed amount, it adds to their well-being. However, if it is drunk in excess, it leads to violence. If it is drunk in equal measure, it provokes madness. And if it is taken undiluted, it leads to paralysis of the body. This is why Dionysus is everywhere called doctor. To conclude, we give thanks to Dionysus, the god of wine and celebration. In ancient Greek rituals, a portion of the celebratory wine was poured out as a sacrifice to the god and to kick off the ceremony. In ancient myth, it was Dionysus who produced the first vintage and drank the first drought of wine. The first drop of wine was a mythical transformation of the blood of his beloved satyr Ampelos, who tragically died. This became the god's gift to the world. The ancient Greeks understood the power of the plant combined with the power of the cup. Even more than 2,000 years later, we continue to recognize the potency or poison of this favored grape beverage. Let's raise a glass to our plant allies and enjoy the gifts we have inherited. As we say in Greek, yamas, cheers to our health.